Good evening, everybody. And it's a pleasure for me to speak to you all tonight about lasers in everyday and restorative dentistry. My history goes back with dental lasers over 30 years. When people didn't even know what a laser was when I was in dental school, I started using lasers. And I've had experience with every wavelength of lasers in, in and all throughout the years. Tonight, we're gonna to focus specifically on diode lasers. We'll talk about diode lasers in as much de detail as we can in the hour that we have, with the goal being to educate you on what you can do tomorrow morning if you have a diode laser. I wanna thank Ultradent and Catapult Education for sponsoring the program. And everything I'm gonna show you tonight are products and cases and materials that I've done in my office and the materials that we use every day in the office. If you're into technology and also wine, you can find me at Vino Dentino on Instagram. That's also the best place to ask me questions. If you have questions, the best place is DM me on Instagram. So you can find me at Vino Dentino. And if you DM me there with questions, I will get back to you usually very, very quickly. I'm also a proud member of the Catapult Education Speakers Bureau. I'm also a board member. And what that means to you is that we work closely on a variety of levels with many manufacturers on a consulting basis. We work closely with dental meetings and dental societies to present information to each and every one of you and your colleagues. And we're really in touch with the latest and greatest in dentistry. Right now on my desk in my office, I have two products ready for me to try that are not launched to the market yet. And the goal is for me to work with those products before it comes to the market to avoid any issues, errors, or mistakes. So we're gonna talk lasers tonight. Before we talk lasers, I wanna talk business for a second because there's a little pet project that myself and a few colleagues have been a part of that has been very exciting to us. And I wanna share that with each and every one of you tonight. The pet project is called Catapult Crown. Catapult Crown was born from the understanding that us as dentists and our families and our extended families love dental technology. And if there was an opportunity to invest in that dental technology, even as a small time investor, we'd likely want to be in that game or in that pool. Catapult Crown is a website that has been formulated that will bring new startup dental technology into the investable space in the hopes of getting the funding that they have needed to either get through FDA, complete FDA, or get to the market. It's an incredible site. Right now, we have a number of companies on there. It's all, by the way, SEC regulated and things like that. We have a few companies on there, all with different areas. Cloud Dentistry is in the dental staffing space. OYM has an incredible, incredible additive that can go into any mouthwash and toothpaste that will literally dissolve calculus off the root. And Magdent has an incredible healing abutment in the implant space that allows bone to grow faster than normal and allows you to load your implant in four weeks. The beautiful thing about Catapult Crown is that no matter what the funding target, target is, it allows accredited investors to invest as little as $10,000 and watch their investment hopefully grow. So Catapult Crown gives you as much information as you can to make an educated and informed decision. Do I want to invest in this company? Of course, they're all risky. That's just the way this is. But some are going to be less risky than others, like cloud dentistry, in my opinion, because they're already making money. But again, you have to feel it. And if you feel it and you want to invest, here's an opportunity to invest through Crown. And it's a way for you to spread some capital over a number of investments, because if one or two of them hit, of course, that's when you make your big money. So that's Catapult Crown. You can Google the website. You can find the information on there and you'll generate a bunch of information that will allow you to make decisions. Getting back to lasers now. We're gonna talk diode lasers tonight. And the goals for this program really is to gain an initial understanding of diode lasers and their use in day-to-day -day practice. I am a 
restorative dentist. I'm a general dentist. I have three offices in the New York area. And everything that I talk about is what I do day in and day out in the office. So in our office today, we have six diode lasers in our Hewlett office, maybe seven actually now. And that allows each operatory to have their own lasers so nobody's fighting for that laser when the other person needs to use it. We're using them in hygiene. We're use, using them in direct restorative dentistry. We're using them in crown and bridge. We're using them in oral surgery, implant dentistry, you name it, diodes come in handy in every one of these aspects. So I always say, if I'd imagine a world without lasers, I'd have to go back to packing cord. I haven't packed cord in probably 15 years because lasers allow me to remove soft tissue in a minimally invasive fashion. And by doing that, and you'll, you'll see a study that I'm gonna share that shows actually that there's less trauma using a diode laser than there is in using cord. So it's, it allows for a predictable impression time and time again, and a great way to get ideal impressions or scans when doing crown and bridge. Uncovering teeth or uncovering implants, another area where diodes will work great. Creating gingival symmetry and proper zenith for aesthetics following orthodontics, or just when you're doing an aesthetic case. Again, the diode is like a laser paintbrush. It allows you to create the landscape that you're looking for when you need it. Things like tongue ties and treating periodontal disease and aptus ulcers and all these things can be done with a diode laser. Diode lasers are really characterized by its wavelength. Their energy is absorbed by pigment and hemoglobin. Now, in the history of diode lasers, while there's been a number of wavelengths, a number on the scale, the two most prominent wavelengths are 810 and 980, which means nothing to most of you. 810 diodes, if you're looking at the electromagnetic spectrum, in theory will cut a drop slower than a 980, but will coagulate much, much better. 980, on the other hand, will cut faster, in theory, and coagulate less so. To the naked eye, the 810 and the 980 cut exactly the same to my naked eye of 30, experience, 30 years experience, but the, the 810 diode will coagulate better, that's for sure. The energy is absorbed, both their energies, by pigment and hemoglobin, which makes them very good soft tissue cutters, and fairly good soft tissue coagulators. The one thing about diodes are they're soft tissue lasers. They cannot cut hard tissue in any capacity at all. Now you might say, well, I have an electrosurgery. I don't need a diode because electrosurgery is cut soft tissue. Well, it's true, but the fact about not needing a diode is really not so true. In comparison to electrosurgery, diodes are more precise. There's far less thermal damage. There's little to no recession. And they're safe to use around metal. They can also be used for treating minor periodontal issues. Electrosurgery, while it cuts soft tissue fairly well, you have a good chance of recession. The patient will have more post-op discomfort due to potential thermal damage. You cannot use it around metal and you cannot use it to treat or control periodontal disease. Now, the reason that people are more uncomfortable following electrosurgery than a diode is due to the amount of thermal damage that you may get with electrosurgery here on the left, wow, versus a diode here on the right. So three to five times more cell layers of damage with the electrosurgery on the left than with the diode on the right. So why diodes? They're minimally invasive. Most patients will report less comfort postoperatively. You can use much less anesthetic. If I'm gonna trough on the lingual of an upper molar 
Very often, I do not need to give anesthetic if I gave on the buckle. We have less bleeding. The patient feels you're high tech, of course, and you could market it, but those are not reasons to get a diode laser. The reason to get a diode laser is it's gonna be more productive for you in your day-to-day -day practice. So if lasers are really the cat's meow, why has been the slow adoption over the years? Well, if you think like a dentist, you'll know the answer very quickly is cost. Sometimes as dentists, we rationalize the fact that we don't need this because it costs me money and I can get things done good enough in another way. But the reality is good enough is typically not good enough. And we can have holes in our treatment. And if there's a way to make us better, then we should consider spending the money to get us the technology to make us better. The other nice thing about spending the money is the government will help us when we spend the money. So this is your section 179 deduction, which I would tell all of you, don't take my word for it, speak to your accountant, even though I'm right, but speak to your accountant. You get a ton of deductible money in a rapid depreciation kind of form. So speak to your accountant with any technology that you're buying about a 179 tax deduction. We said that diode lasers energy is absorbed by pigment and hemoglobin, and they're great soft tissue cutters and coagulators. Here is your learning curve. All lasers, including diodes, have delivery that are end cutting. Why is that a learning curve for us? Well, when we use a burr, like a 557, the burr is end cutting as well as side cutting. But with a diode, the energy precedes the tip. So you have to move your hand nice and slowly in order to get a faster cut because the energy is ahead of your tip. And depending on the laser you're using with diodes, let's talk diodes, to cut diodes must be in contact with the soft tissue. If we're gonna use the energy for anything else other than to cut, like treating an aphthous ulcer, well then we're gonna be out of contact. But if we're cutting, we're always gonna be in contact. That's the learning curve. Conquer that, you can use a diode laser. Now, for years I would say a diode is a diode is a diode because they really were pretty much exactly the same. Five years ago, Ultradent launched a laser. Remember I told you that diodes can be either 810 or 980 in wavelength and 810 cuts, fat, cuts slower but coagulates better and 980 cuts faster, but coagulates slower, if you can actually tell. What Alternate did is they, they created a laser that has two lasers in one box that can be used independently. So you could use the 810 or use the 980 or press a button and actually merge the wavelengths together, a dual wavelength laser. On top of that, Traditional diode lasers are what we call pulsed lasers. There was something inside the laser when you put it in pulse mode where the laser would go on and off and on and off. But it would happen so quickly that it was imperceptible to the eye. So it was more like on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, like that. The advantage of that is when the laser was on half the time and off half the time, you could do certain procedure without anesthetic was much more comfortable to the patient. So if you had your laser in pulse mode and you were at 1.5 watts, you get an average wattage of 0.75 because it was what we would call a 50-50 gated pulse. The laser was on 50% of the time and off 50% of the time. Would it still cut? Yes, it would cut quickly, but it was on, off, on, off, on, off. Well, five years ago, when Ultranet launched the Gemini, they launched this dual, wave, dual wave, wavelength laser that was pulsed, but it wasn't pulsed like traditional lasers. It was what we call super pulse. So now imagine something in the box, instead of shutting the energy on and off, on and off, it was a computer that ramped the energy up so high and immediately shut it off. So it wasn't a 50-50 pulse like the old lasers, 
Well, it would boost the energy up. It was a two watt laser. It would boost the energy up to 20 watts and immediately drop it. So you'd have the equivalent of cutting of 20 watts, but it behaved like two watts. And it became this fastest cutting laser in the diode space in dentistry. Well, last year, Alternate launched their second model to this. And this is called the Gemini Evo. So you have the Gemini and the Gemini Evo. And the Evo's energy was able to be multiplied. So you had the equivalent of 100 watts of cutting, then back down to two watts. So much, much faster, yet still kind to the tissue. So here is the Evo. Let me show you. That's the Gemini Evo. And it was really a huge change from the Gemini and just different than anything else on the market. So you got a little basic science as much as I can give you in an hour program. Let's get clinical a little bit. So this is not my statistics. This is Glidewell, the biggest dental lab in the country statistics. 50% of all dental impressions do not show the entire margin needed for fabrication and 70% of impressions have incomplete finish lines. And 36% of dentists retake impressions three or more times in a month. The goal here is to make it easy. I didn't believe that stat. So I went to my local dental lab and I said, Gary, I wanna look at some impressions. And he said, okay, you can look at impressions, don't look at the doctor's names. And I started seeing things like this and this. but it should look like this. And this is what you should be able to get every time when using a diode laser, not missing margins like this. Here's a study I was talking about. Gingival displacement using a diode laser or retraction cord, a comparative clinical study. The amount of gingival retraction and restoration to baseline resulting from use of gingival retraction cords or diode laser technique is similar, but diode laser required less time, was simpler for the operator, and was more comfortable to the patient than retraction, telling you that a diode laser here was a better choice. Let me take you through this video a little bit, and you'll kind of see here, I, I was going to drop the finish line to where I created my trough, but I'll give you some idea with the diode. The patient is anesthetized, and you'll get to see how the tissue is removed. This is using the 810. Gemini, 810, 810 to the watt.
And what you see is virtually no bleeding. Skinny syringe with a little peroxide. This is peroxide in an ultra dense skinny syringe with an infuser brush from Ultradent. It easily remove any of the tissue. It allows you to remove the straggling tissue. If you're not using this brush, get a sample or order some. They are indispensable for a variety of things. If you have some straggling tissue, you want to take a plastic instrument. Take a plastic instrument. It might bleed more you tissue, have to back the laser, that away right here. but it'll remove the tissue. We'll go back in with that 810. Now just Actually, stop the energy. We'll go back in. To 0.6 of a watt. To 6 tenths of a watt. The Gemini 810. To the 810. The recommended setting is 8 and tenths. I'm below the recommended setting at 6 tenths of a watt. I can cut quite easily. With a lot of control. Now I can drop my margin. I can do whatever I want to do here to get me to the finish line, so to speak. Now we're at 980. Now just for demo purposes, I use the 980 to show you, and you likely won't be able to tell the difference in cutting. 980 is 0.6. Again, even here, you don't see any bleeding. It cuts, you do not see any bleeding. Now you do want to keep either a surgical suction or a high speed suction close by kind just like because it will smell if not. The patient will think something's burning. Lots of control. And now we're using the dual wavelength of 0 0.6. So now we've combined both wavelengths. Both wavelengths we've combined for the blue wavelength at point six. And again, basically no bleeding. Showing you that all three wavelengths of cut. Once I get that done, I'm then going to finish my margin with an end cutting diamond to eliminate the potential lip. If you look at this particular burr, there is no grits on the shank itself, just here on the end. And I can go ahead and go ahead and finish that finish line. So I have a smooth finish line. Now, for me here, it's about control. And I'm using NSK's electric hand pieces here to give me the control that I need at about 20,000 RPM. We pretty much completed our preparation. We've taken our NSK NLZ electric hand piece and dialed it down to about 18,000 RPM. And we're going to refine the margin using this fur from microcopy that has us some diamonds at the end. And what we're going to do is just smooth that margin off.
Basically, bring the margin. Don't take off. any lips out. Thank you. You can kind of see we just did that. We'll show you one more time. Right here at the lateral incisor at the gingival margin. You've got to so make sure that you can leave a lip. Very key to getting a perfect margin is smoothing things off, especially the finish line. So we use the NSK electrics and, and, and they're outstanding hand pieces. They have, they're a lighter hand piece than most manufacturers. We all know today in dental school, 55% of our students are female and it's important to have things that um, the female hand will become comfortable with. They have electric that's lighter, that's easier to use. And I can dial down that energy exactly to the power that I need to give me the control. So I showed you a little bit about indirect restorative dentistry. What about direct restorative dentistry? So this gal comes in and I knew right away I had decay here between the bicuspids, even though nothing was on the radiograph. It just looked funny to me, especially here. Just looked funny. So one of the things that you can do when you have something you're not sure about is use different modalities to give you the answer. So this is the Microlux from Aden. And the Microlux is a trans illumination light. I can shine that light in between the teeth. In this situation, when I did, it confirmed that there was something on that bicuspid. Now I'm gonna take you back to, what you have to understand is the tissue here is very high. If in fact there is something here, when I drop that box, I'm gonna be sub G. And I gotta be able to now tell that patient that you might need a gum procedure. I'm not gonna say gingivectomy because they don't know what a gingivectomy is, but you might need a gum procedure to modify the level of the gum so I can fix your filling. So first of all, we open it up and you see the decay now in approximately that was confirmed by the transillumination light. The minute I prep this though now, exactly what we feared. So here's where we pick up the diode laser and gently use it to clean up the soft tissue. Now you can see a box. You can see that you can put a matrix in there and restore it. This is the Triadent matrix band. The Triadent matrix system allows you to create ideal contours, ideal shapes, just by placing a band a wedge and a ring on the tooth. That ring is a night tie ring that will not only allow for pushing of the interproximal contact by separation of the teeth, but it'll, when you're done, it will restore itself to its full capacity without any harm to the ring itself. So this is a Triadent matrix system that's sold by Ultradent. When it sits on the tooth, it's gonna to actually sit on the wedge. By sitting on the wedge, it allows stability of the ring. Because in the old days, you know what happened, that ring used to pop off. You'd have this perfect band placed and all of a sudden the ring would just pop itself off. So the ring would pop off and you'd get all frustrated while you're in the middle of a procedure. Well, today the tree end system will actually sit on the wedge. There's a V cut out for that ring to sit on the wedge, give you some separation, and then allow you to have ideal preparation. And you can see here that the wedge is here. You see the separation is there. Selective etch. Now we could talk about selective etch versus total etch, but in my opinion, the way I've done dentistry for years is I've always selectively etched. And the reason is there are a lot of mistakes that can happen if you go ahead and etch dent. So we don't etch dent, we selectively etch. We apply our adhesive in place. Now it's really important, I know you're gonna laugh, but it's really important to read the instruction sheet 
inside the box of the adhesive because most of us never do that. But if you read the instruction sheet, what you'll see more than likely is you will see that each of these materials, if you talk to your friends, are used differently. Some of them are just at a left on the tooth, and that's Shofu's beauty bond adhesive. You put it on the dent and you leave it alone. Many other ones are agitated for how long becomes the question. 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. All those things become in question when using an adhesive, and you need to know that. Finally, the restoration is filled. When the restoration is filled, the band itself has the ability to be removed. There's a little hole right where that forcep is picking it up and it locks or grabs into that hole so you can remove the band, clean up the marginal ridge and have a restoration with perfect contour. Now this isn't GV Black doing dentistry for three hours. This is a routine class two restorative composite on a day-to-day -day basis. It's what we do, but we do it with assistance of the hygiene. Now, the question I always get is, do you charge for that? My answer is yes, I charge for it. So the rule of thumb when doing troughing or exposing a margin, my rule of thumb, my rule of thumb is as follows. If I trough for me, I don't charge. If I trough for them, I do charge. So in this situation, we knew the cavity was going to be sub G. I'm troughing not for me, I'm troughing it for them because they won't have a restoration or a good one if it's not troughed. Crown and bridge, if I'm troughing a routine crown, I don't charge. If I'm troughing because the patient had a temporary in place and didn't come back for three weeks and now the tissue's all overgrown, well then yes, I'm gonna charge a patient for that. So it just really depends on ethics, how you wanna deal with diodes and are you gonna charge or not. Implant uncovery. Well, implant uncovery is a whole nother animal because as we said, you can use diodes around metal. Well, if you can use diodes around metal, then there's no reason not to use them around ortho brackets, amalgam. And in here, a cover screw of an implant. So very simply in this situation, we place some anesthetic right here lingually, right here buckly, in approximately. We unscrew this and we unscrew a mold and we screw in an impression coping to take a scan or a mold of that particular implant. Here was a scan. So first we're scanning the emergence profile. We screw in a scanning flag. Scan that, mount, send to the lab, bring the patient back 10 days later, gonna unscrew that. Notice the implant's placed perfectly. Of course, we're gonna take x-rays on it. Once that's seated, we're gonna place Teflon tape into the access hole and a product called Permaflow. Permaflow can be white, it can be pink, it can be purple, we use the white one. And that's a composite that we'll put into the access. We're not gonna etch, we're not gonna bond. We're just gonna put it in the access to take up space. So food doesn't get caught in the access for no reason. Gingivectomies. So obviously during orthodontics, gingivectomies become a vital part of treatment. And the reality is, is that it's simple to do with a diode. So one of the things you could see here is I got the patient numb, and then I took a perioprobe and I made two little dots there. Actually one in the middle. We do that because what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I've measured with a probe how deep the probe goes. I'm gonna stay within what I hope is biological width, and I'm gonna remove that tissue. All right, so we're gonna be doing here an exposure or a gingivectomy on tooth number 11. You see the tissue has grown up dramatically. Uh, usually this happens because of plaque. We're using the Evo dual wavelength preset for gingivectomy at nine tenths of a watt. Now the goal here is just to give exposure. We don't need to do a lot. The patient is anesthetized. She's not gonna feel anything at all. Gonna see how quickly 
This will remove the tissue. The tissue is moderately thick here as well. And all I'm looking to do is create that C shape that it should look like. I can go right to the tooth since the energy is not absorbed by the tooth structure. And what you're not going to see is you're not going to see any bleeding, despite the fact this tissue is inflamed. We're dancing around under the wire. Very quickly, you're going to see this piece disappear. Just like that. Now you see the tissue. And now you totally see how clean look at that. We see this Not absorbed by the tooth. Look how clean that is. The tissue's totally the tissue exposed. Is going to heal right I do there. a little bit more here by the bicuspid, just to give a little bit access. For hygiene. The thing is, once you start here, you just go and go and go. Two other things to point out. When the diode cuts, it's heat. You get a bacterial cytal effect on the remaining tissue as well, or a and or a biostimulation effect on the tissue. That's very, very important. And just cleaning up around these brackets is gonna make the area much healthier for this kind of thing. So we do have some moderately thick tissue here, so I'm just going to thin things out a little bit, and then we're going to be done with this tooth. I'm just snow planing or snow plowing now the tissue to thin out that inflamed pathology. You can see now how cleanly we've exposed these teeth. And we're going to do a little modification right here in the center. Turn to me a little bit. What about phrenectomies? Well, a couple of points on phrenectomies. You don't need a lot of anesthetic because you don't want to distort the freedom. One drop on either side of the freedom is all you really need. So one drop here and here. You also want to make sure to make an incision horizontally behind those centrals. This is a neat little tool called a Groove Director. You can get it from Henry Schein. It was originally intended as a veterinary tool, but I think now it's in the dental catalog and you can buy it from them. The one thing you do want to be careful of is you don't want the laser energy to reflect off the shiny metallic surface of the Groove Director because it can reflect off and cause damage somewhere. So always make sure your laser is pointed downwards at the soft tissue and not at the Groove Director. We always finish our incisions the same way, either no sutures or one suture, but primarily a product called glue stitch or it could be called skin stitch at this, at this point. And glue stitch is a purple dental cyanoacrylate, crazy glue, that when dipped into the wound or dripped into the wound, it acts as a mechanical barrier in the wound to prevent bacteria of getting in and also prevents the early migration of soft tissue into the wound. So you get slow healing, but continuous healing. And then what's gonna happen eventually is this Sanoacrylate will basically fall off like a scab. This is a long video, but I want to take you through part of it so you could see it. So we're going to do maxillary phrenectomy here with the Gemini dual wavelength. This little tool here, this retraction tool, is something called a groove director that'll keep everything out of the way. Uh, we've raised the energy from the preset from 1.3 to 1.5 watts because of the lack of pigmented tissue here. This uh, gentleman has just finished Invisalign and we're going to do the phrenectomy. So you see the freedom kind of runs all the way from the lip down to the teeth and it's really important that we kind of remove all this, kind of chop the roots of the tree so we don't have relapse. So the first thing we're going to do is just take the Gemini and just hover over the soft tissue and that's just going to heat it up. You feel anything at all? Mm -mm. Great. Patient doesn't feel anything. We've given a little bit of septicane here, here, and here. 
And we're going to go ahead now and just little by little, in contact, begin that touch to touch the frenum. And as we do this, all phrenectomies, the muscle is fan shaped. So it's going to fan out like that of a diamond or a baseball diamond. Notice how cleanly the Gemini performs here. Now, if we get a deep vessel, we may get a little bit of bleeding, but initially, right here, nothing. I'm going to continue to dissect the freedom as we go through. Careful not to shine that laser off the groove director, because that groove director is reflecting, can reflect... <coughs> They want, we don't want the energy to reflect back really to the person who's shooting this video. Now, we continue to dissect. You'll see the freedom start to pull here. I could feel the muscle fibers beginning to separate. So right there, there's some muscle fibers. And I'm going to go ahead and separate that. And I would expect the freedom to open right up as I do that. And here's where it'll begin. To separate. Now because we have a very long tissue here, we'll stop at some point, remove the groove director, just to evaluate where we are. Notice so far, not one drop of blood. got some very very tight muscle fibers here we want to make sure to dissect right down to that periosteum the whole way you can see that the freedom opens up pressing on the soft tissue on the periosteum you make sure that I am flowing that periosteum and again we're dissecting upwards so at this point we're about halfway through and it's only been I don't know, a minute it's or so. now into it. And we're going to stop and just look, evaluate where we are, remove the groove director, and kind of see what we got going on. Notice we've dissected up the frenum, and if you can see what happens, there's two things going on here. You see even a little accessory, little skin tag here, and that probably was from when he had a space, the tissue flopped in. But take a look real quick what we've done. The frenum is still there, so I'm going to have to still dissect that. Now I'm going to go without the groove director, because that will uh, allow me to visualize the anatomy better. And I'm going to dissect all the way up here. My purpose of showing these is unedited videos, despite they're a little bit long. I want you to see higher tissue interaction. Notice there's no bleeding. What you want and to do? The diode cuts well. Is you want to be able to persistently. Visualize the fibers that cause the pull. And sometimes you got to really go lateral. Notice the diamond-shaped incision that's starting to starting to occur. Um, this little skin tag here is going to get removed also at the same time. We'll do that at the end. But what's happening right now is you see that freedom is kind of now pretty much has been opened up. We still have some fibers here that I could see pulling. that I'm going to go back and now continue. Notice here, the laser is being held on an angle, really for one reason, so I can shoot a clean video. And I get really, really nice visualization here. So I'm going through, and we begin to finish our dissection. You kind of see where we are. The muscle is really up here. You kind of get an idea of where this is going and where this went. And again, there's plenty of these in each and everybody's practice. You just have to go looking for them, but they're there. Probably one of the best ways to heal or make the pain go away of a herpetic lesion is using a diode laser. I have a woman that came to me most recently because she Googled my name. She knew I was a laser person and knew you could help aptus ulcers and herpetic lesions with a diode laser and she got them all the time. 
So up until now, you saw a few cases where we used the laser in contact with a herpetic lesion or an aptus ulcer. We're going to do it out of contact. Now, even though the amount of energy coming out of this tip is so low, I mean, you could put it to your hand and you're not going to feel it. These things are uncomfortable. So you might, they might feel it a drop. So the trick is you want to hover over the lesion 10 millimeters away with this diode and move closer until they say, oh, that's hot. And just hang out there for 30 seconds and then stop and do it again. Now start near there and go a little closer and do that for five or six passes till you can almost, almost touch the lesion. And then the person is going to feel immediately better and likely won't bother you again. Again, I like to support what I say with science. This is comparing the effect of diode laser against a cyclovir cream, which is the standard in treating herpetic lesions. Now it was only a 20 person study, but treatment with a diode laser reduced the length of recovery time and pain severity faster than treatment with a cyclovir cream. So diodes actually were better than the cream itself. So I was giving a, a I, was, I was at an ultra dent key opinion leader meeting in Utah, and I broke out with a herpetic lesion on my lip. So I reached out to the key opinion liaison, Jason. I said, I need a diode. I'm going to treat myself and I'm going to video it. So now imagine me. I have my laser glasses on. You'll see I'm going to use the diode to treat my lip. I'm looking at it in the bathroom mirror in the hotel and recording it in the other hand. So I'm going to do a quick demo on how to treat a herpetic lesion with the Gemini. And being that I've been sick for a few weeks and I feel a herpetic lesion coming out on my top lip, it's hard to see. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So this is an uninitiated tip at half a watt. I'm gonna get real close. But not touching. Without touching. And move in circles. I can feel the heat, so I know the energy is there. Now I'm about to I'll get as close as I can you. without hurting myself. I'll do it for about 15 seconds, and then we'll shoot it again. And I felt the heat because it's a, it's a newly erupted herpetic lesion, so. Um, I, now I was a few millimeters away. Now I'm going to try to get almost touching it. We'll see if we can show you that. I want to come start right here. And we'll go ahead and treat it again. Now, normally I would say when treating herpetic lesions, you want to keep a high speed suction close by because there are studies that show there could be herpetic viral particles in the plume. Obviously at the hotel, I didn't have that option, but normally you want to keep a high speed suction close by to suck up any of those potential viral particles. Let's show you an off label use. So one of the things we've been able to um, do with this laser is we can do what we call photobiomodulation, PBM, cold laser therapy, soft laser therapy, all different terms for the same thing. The ability to use laser energy to make bad cells behave like good cells. This is a non-cutting footprint. It just is able to seep in past the soft tissue and get to a place to make patient more comfortable. Things like TMJ pain, things like muscular pain, all these things you could hold into the cheek and in a certain protocol, put energy into the cheek and treating them twice a week, they get better. Since COVID, vaccine or not, booster or not, I have seen an inordinate amount of Bell's palsy, more than I care to have admit, and more than I've seen in my whole life. And I read a study years ago that you can use a diode laser to help reverse a Bell's palsy. But first you have to kind of know how to treat and what to treat. This is Kurt. He had Bell's palsy 10 days ago. 
He was placed by his doctor on steroids, no response. Antibiotics, no response. Mouthwash, no response. Bell's palsy does resolve in 75% of the cases on their own, but resolution could take up to six months. So this is Kurt. And I'm like, maybe I could treat this with my diode and make him better. You have nothing to lose. And Kurt was all over it, so why not? But you have to know the innervation of Bell's palsy. And this is an off-label use. It's not FDA approved. It's just a way of helping your patients. But you look and see that the innervation of the nerves is forehead to the chin. So you have to be able to move the handpiece around in multiple intervals to get about three to four minutes in total treatment time over the side of the face and do that twice a week. So we did it twice a week, six to eight minutes application, moving it around, kind of like this. Just following the pathway, patient doesn't feel anything. But at one point, when we were up there, we saw his face twitch somewhere down here. This is the first appointment, and I knew I was able to help him. I got some excitation of the nerves. We move this around six to eight minutes. Week two, maybe some slight improvement. Maybe I'm imagining it. Week three. Now I'm saying, okay, we're getting better. Week four, Kurt says he's getting much better, still can't close his eye. Week five, he's able to open his eye wider and he's in a way of a better mood. And week six, Kurt can close his eye and he's in a jolly old mood. So six weeks before and after using a diode to treat. Now, a couple of things about this one. Would I charge the patient? Nothing. We did this as a service. Could you charge palliative treatment if you want to? Absolutely. I didn't charge the patient anything. Two, could it have been coincidental? Well, the answer is it could have, but he was on steroids and antivirals for 10 days prior, or initially 10 days with no result. That's what sought him to come to me. So I don't want to say it's coincidental by any stretch. This is the laser really doing its thing. So it's a quick hour, hours go by fast, but we know diode lasers are a great addition to any practice, they're versatile. You can combine them with other technology for ideal treatment. There's something that we can't live without in our office that we use every single day, that Gemini and the Gemini Evo. So thank you. And we have about less some time for questions. I saw there was a whole bunch. So I'm gonna to go to the Q and A. So Jeff asked, what do I charge for troughing? And as I said earlier, if I trough for me, just because it's easier for me to take an impression, I do not charge. I'll only charge the patient if they have bad perio, tissue has grown over because they lost the temporary and decided not to come back, so on and so forth. If I charge the patient, I'll charge them 150, 175, 195. If it's really, really involved, the back of the mouth, it's a pain in the neck, maybe two and a quarter, but very, very rarely. Thank you for that question. Um, Jeff also asked me what CDT code I use, and the answer is there is no code for that. So do I feel that the PBM attachment is just the, the three millimeters, is just as effective as uninitiated for cold sores? So what I didn't have time to get into tonight was that with the Evo, there are three different attachments. The 25 millimeter attachment that I showed you, a seven millimeter that you use after an endo on the soft tissue, and a three millimeter, almost a pinpoint. And what Sherry's asking me is, do I feel that the PBM attachment is just as effective as the uninitiated tip for cold sores? And the answer is yes. I think they're exactly effective. What is the average cost of a diode? The average cost of a diode, to be very honest, will depend on what diode you buy. The ultra dent diode is about 8,000 bucks. That's because it's a super pulse diode, but you can buy a, diode, a regular diode for 3,500 bucks. Ron, there are a few questions in the chat box as well. Are you able to pull that up? Yep. By the way, the all, all this will be replayed on YouTube. I see some of you having video problems. It shouldn't be because I've given this 
program on other sites before. So I think it'll be fine on YouTube. I don't know why we're having issues tonight with the video because it was perfectly smooth on my end. Andrew asked what the reason for the phrenectomy was. So very often, if you have a diastema and you will see a muscle that hangs down all the way in between the centrals or post-orthodontics, you will have a eight and nine that have cracked open. And usually that's because of a muscle. And that's in that situation. There was a muscle that was attached in between the two teeth. And that's why we did the phrenectomy. Do I place anything before permaflow? So the, so the answer is in the implant. Some people would like to bond it in. I tend not to bond it in. And the reason is if I have to get back in there to retorque something, it's much easier to drill out if I don't bond it in than if I do. So I tend not to bond it in. It's still hard to drill out of that implant screw hole, but I tend not to bond it in. Would I treat the PBM the same way as uninitiated tips for the cold source? Thank you, Sherry. Yes. So the PBM attachment, because it's not hot, it's cold laser, so to speak, I would use it exactly the same way. And with the Evo, you have a setting for that three or seven millimeter attachment that you could just go ahead and hit that and it will work. I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. I hope you learned a little bit about diodes. And um, this will be available on YouTube that you can watch and replay. Thanks very much.